Hello, my name is Andy Hill, and I'm going to talk to you about probabilistic approaches to limit state analysis. This presentation will be about probabilistic approaches to limit state analysis, which are sometimes referred to as reliability analyses. All right, let's look at the primary objective of this presentation and some of the key concepts you should take away from it. The point of this presentation is to give you a better understanding of the available methods for conducting a probabilistic analysis of a traditional limit state problem. For this presentation, a good example of a limit state analysis is a simple limit equilibrium, a limit equilibrium analysis like a slope instability problem that compares dri driving forces to resisting forces and yields a simple factor of safety. This sounds complicated, but all we're really talking about here is just a different way to do a sensitivity analysis on a problem. Um, some key concepts of the presentation. Uh, are that variables in any formula or problem can be programmed into a spreadsheet that can be programmed into a spreadsheet can be treated as random variables that we can affix probability distributions to. The distributions can be as simple as a standard distribution or like a bell curve based on a reasonable low value of that variable, a best estimate of that variable and a high reasonable, reasonable uh, value of that variable. This allows the solution of the output parameter, for example, the calculated factor of safety, to be treated as a distribution as well. Essentially, if your inputs are distribution, your output will be one as well. The likelihood of the output parameter being greater than the limit state, for instance, the likelihood of the factor of safety being greater than one, can be used to assess the likelihood of poor performance. So let's briefly describe the topics we're gonna to touch on today. This is a presentation focuses on the Monte Carlo simulation approach where we run iterations of the same factor of safety problem, 100, 10,000, 10,000 times, whatever, uh, whatever we choose. Randomly selecting one sample of each input of each of the inputs for each iteration according to the probability distribution that we've selected. All those iterations should build a probability distribution of the answer that will tell us, for example, how many times the answer yielded a factor of safety below one and how many were above one. However, reliability methods such as first order second moment can also be used. First order, second moment is similar to a Monte Carlo simulation, except that instead of running 10,000 iterations of the same problem, you're only running a few. Typically one iteration for the low, best and high estimate of each of the input parameters. Uh, you can see uh, the written chapter for more details about this, but essentially if you got three input parameters and you wanna do three iterations for each one of those, low, best and high, that's three times three, that's about nine iterations. So that's kind of what we're talking about uh, with re regard to this first order, second moment thing. So we're going to talk about three examples in this presentation, a post liquefaction embankment stability analysis, an RCC gravity dam sliding stability analysis, and a foundation rock wedge stability analysis. We'll also talk about the general use of simulated factors of safety and how to use them in a risk analysis context and uh, what other applications are possible for this particular technique. So let's talk about factors of safety and how they can be used as a stability index or you know, an indicator of stability. Safety factors lower than 1.0 are theory, theoretically associated with the loss of limit equilibrium stability. In limit equilibrium based design, the required factor of safety would typically be greater than 1.0 in order to account for the uncertainty in the stability analysis inputs. So when we think about that, a factor of safety 0.1, that's sort of the limit. So it's right on the edge of failure where driving forces are equal to resisting forces. However, when we're designing something, we usually select something like 1.3, 1.5, 1.6, whatever, to allow for some conservatism in our design because we aren't absolutely certain about the specific value of some of our inputs, like shear strength or piezometric head and embankment. Um, but when deterministic factors of safety are used in, in, as information in the risk analysis, their meaning is typically weighed uh, against other elements in the context of evaluating evaluating more likely and less likely factors. I'm sure you've all heard the saying that every model is wrong, but some models are useful. We're gonna talk, we're gonna hear about that over and over in this presentation. No model can capture the complexities of reality. So we put together a separate list of factors, considerations or observations that make a structure more or less likely to fail that weren't necessarily accounted for in our simplistic model and weigh the accuracy of that model against those factors. In this context, a safety factor close to 1.0 could be used as, to argue both for and against stability, depending on the application or the factors not accounted for in that model. 
So we want to make sure we're exercising our brains to make sure we believe and agree with the results of these analyses. Um, and Monte Carlo analysis is going to help us do that. When the factor of safety is treated as a random variable, the uncertainties of the analysis inputs is explicitly accounted for by putting uh, what the lowest reasonable, the best, and the highest reasonable values of the inputs to the problem are in the form of a distribution, like what we're showing here on the slide. <clears throat> For example, the average saf uh, safety factors in both of these plots will be the same, but the spread of the driving and resisting force distributions, which are the inputs to the problem, are different. In the bottom plot, the spread of the driving and resisting forces distributions is wider, indicating the lowest and the highest reasonable values that we use to define those distributions are lower and higher, respectively. They are uh, than they are in the top plot. Also note that the area where the inputs overlap is larger, indicating a higher probability for the factor of safety to be below one because we are more uncertain about the inputs. Here's an overview of the approach to carry out an analysis like this that we'll use uh, as we discuss some of these examples. Program your determinant. So step one to this whole thing would be to program your deterministic analysis, for example, a factor safety equation, into Microsoft Excel or some other program so that we can start our Monte Carlo analysis. Sometimes other programs like Soap Stability Software will have the option to carry out probabilistic analyses as well, though the inputs may vary. If that's the case, ensure the program is using probability distributions you're comfortable with. Excuse me. If using Excel, then you're going to want to activate an add-in like an like at risk or some other commercially available macro add-in. Uh, this allows us to do these probabilistic distributions. Instead of defining the input parameters as point values in our problem, we define them as distributions uh, or, or a, an assortment of, of inputs, if you will, typically informed by estimating a reasonable low, best, and reasonable high estimate of each parameter could be to help us outline that distribution. Uh, at that point, we can perform a, a Monte Carlo analysis to generate a distribution of output, uh, of output safety factors by repeatedly sampling input distributions over and over again, 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times, whatever you set it for. You, then we're going to use that output distribution of safety factors to evaluate the probability of unsatisfactory performance in, let's say, our risk analysis. One option is to use the analysis to see what the probability is that the factor of safety blows blows falls below 1.0. The probability that the factor of safety is less than one equals the number of iterations or hits of this Monte Carlo analysis that the factor of safety is less than one divided by the total number of iterations or risks. Um, uh, number of iterations or trials, excuse me. Or you can use the information more qualitatively. We'll talk about that again in a, a couple of minutes. So let's look at an example of a screening level evaluation of a post liquefaction stability for an embankment dam. Here are some pieces of background information to help us frame this problem. <clears throat> so again, this is uh, discipline specific, but the methods that we're gonna use to analyze this can apply to all disciplines. So forgive some of the deep detail dive on some of these pieces and parts, but we're just using it as a vehicle to kind of show these probabilistic analyses. So, uh, this embankment is a 76 foot high homogeneous earth fill embankment constructed in the late 1940s. The embankment is composed of clay sand compacted in thin lifts with a sheep's foot roller. It has a cutoff trench through 20 feet of alluvium down to rock. Three borings have been drilled through the downstream shell to help us characterize the foundation alluvium. Uh, it's a continuous clean sand layer about four to six feet thick uh, and about eight feet below the embankment foundation contact. It has an N160 clean sand blow count values ranging from 13 to 15. Um, and a wet area at the toe of the dike indicates the sand layer is below phreatic, phreatic surface and therefore is subject to liquefaction. So we've got a problem here. The dam is located in a seismically active area. So our failure mode is given that the foundation sand layer liquefies, what's the probability of post seismic slope instability? So uh, here's a cross section of our embankment in question. Uh, note the orange layer is the liquefiable foundation sand. The best estimates of the strength parameters of the embankment and the foundation materials are shown in the table at the top. Uh, so just in the side here, um, sometimes specific material properties are not always available during risk assessments and other means of estimating those parameters need to be pursued. W one of many good resources for that is the design of small dams published by the Bureau of Reclamation, seen here. 
Um, such resources can also be used to help you establish a reasonable range of values that can inform your estimates of high and low reasonable values of your input parameters. So maybe you have some lab results that indicate what these values probably are, but consulting some additional references may help you open up those um, range of values to allow you to account for more uncertainty in what you're analyzing the model. So here we have a minimum, maximum, and mean values of the unit weight and strength parameters for the clay, sand, and bank line materials, as well as the standard deviation. These values were used to define normal distributions that were entered into our slope W uh, program, which is a slope stability software, um, to perform a Monte Carlo probabilistic slope stability analysis. So you're seeing the inputs to our, uh, to our problem. Uh, similar ranges of material properties need to be estimated for other soils as well. Since the problem we're given is asking us to analyze and make stability given liquefaction has occurred, we need to estimate what that post liquefaction shear strength of the eight foot thick foundation uh, sand layer is. For the background information, we know that the N160 clean sand below count averages between 13 to 15. We can use a figure from Seed et al. in 2003 to estimate post liquefaction shear strength as having a reasonable low value of about 400 PSF, a reasonable high estimate of about 920, and a mode of about 660. So we'll use those estimates to define a triangular distribution that will enter into our slope stability analysis. And here we see the results of that analysis. This slide depicts the stability analysis using the best estimate parameters on the table that yields a factor of safety of about 1.075. But how do we use this information in our risk analysis? Can we tweak this analysis using our available information to provide a probability of failure instead of just a single factor of safety? Yes, we can. Instead of using single values to define the material properties for each of our soils, we can use the probability distributions that capture the ranges of these properties in a Monte Carlo analysis. That will randomly sample values of each property over and over again to build a set of factors of safety against instability. So essentially exploring all possible scenarios and giving us an indication of which of those scenarios occur more often. What's our peak? You know, when do those things happen the most? slide depicts that set of factors of safety results of, of what that set of factors safety results may look like. This probability distribution was built as a result of 10,000 iterations in a Monte Carlo analysis. The mean set factor of safety is 1.07, which is kind of the peak of our uh, of our plot there, right through there, um, which corresponds to the peak of the normal distribution shown in this figure. If we're concerned with the likelihood of slope instability, then we would be interested in how many of these results flow below, fall below a factor of safety of 1.0, somewhere about right there. <clears throat> In this case, uh, a little over 2,000 of those, of those 10,000 10, 10, iterations yield results uh, that fall below a factor of safety 1.0, indicating the probability of slope instability is about 0.24. Another way to say that is, based on this analysis, there's a 24% chance of failure. Um, so here's another way of looking at those results. Uh, this graph shows the percentage of results shown on the y-axis that fall below any given factor of safety shown on the x-axis. So the results of a Monte Carlo analysis can be used in different ways. So say that your definition of failure isn't when a slide occurs, which can be rep represented by a factor of safety 1.0, but instead your definition of failure is excessive deformation of the slope in question. And in that case, perhaps you will start to see deformation when your factor of safety approaches something more like 1.1, or maybe that's something else like 1.2 or 1.3 for high walls or something. Based on the Monte Carlo analysis, the probability of the slopes will start to experience excessive deformation then, as defined by a factor of safety 1.1, becomes approximately 0.64 or 64%. So you can use this information in different ways to tell you different things. So how do we use this information when we're conducting a risk analysis? Uh, in the case of our post-liquefaction slope instability failure mode, considering the following of entry, uh, an earthquake occurs, a liquefiable layer exists in the foundation, continuous liquefaction is triggered because of this earthquake, slope instability occurs, and crest loss exceeds the available freeboard, resulting in an uncontrolled release of the reservoir, breaches the dam, etc. So the Monte Carlo analysis could be used directly as the probability for, uh, to an estimate for event four, but that's not really recommended. Why? because all models are wrong and some models are, but some models are useful. Again, no model can completely account for the complexities of reality. So we use the Monte Carlo analysis results as a starting point for the event four probability estimate, and then apply some adjustments based on 
other factors that were not in the analysis. This allows the results to be used qualitatively and taken into consideration along with other more and less likely factors. So that's how we do that, is we weigh other factors that's outside our model uh, against that result of the, of the analysis we did. So let's talk about a few caveat, caveats to that. Once eliminate equilibrium analysis does not since an equilibrium analysis, analysis does not give a sense of how much deformation could occur, a finite element analysis would typically be performed in support of a higher level risk assessment. I might say that a finite, a finite element analysis could be performed, not necessarily would be performed. Um, if a higher order analysis like an, a finite element analysis, which is expensive and takes a lot of time, has already been built for a project, it wouldn't be difficult to use that model perhaps with some updated parameters to help inform your risk assessment. But since these models are difficult, time consuming and therefore expensive to construct, only in rare cases will be performed. Um, even if a low probability of slope instability were indicated, this would not necessarily rule out all other seismic potential failure modes. So don't turn your brain off and let the analysis do all the work. Um, this analysis is only modeling one specific mode of failure, uh, but an earthquake could cause all, all sorts of problems. Um, some sort of new mark sliding, uh, new mark type sliding could occur, or there could be uh, a landslide in the reservoir that results in a seiche wave that overtops the embankment. Just don't prematurely rule out other seismic failure modes. So always going to keep stay loose on all this stuff. Um, not all equilibrium equilibrium stability analysis programs include a Monte Carlo simulation capability. Some do, but provide limited flexibility in defining the input parameter distributions. For example, inputs may be limited to the mean and standard deviation of the input parameter. And these situate and, and that means you can't choose the shape of your distribution. Um, in these situations, the user should dig a little deeper into the program documentation and be aware of what kind of distributions are being used for the input parameters and consider not wh whether or not they're appropriate. Um, so let's look at another example. This time an RCC gravity dam. The potential ferry mode we're examining in this example is sliding along a cold joint located in the lower part of the dam. So the dam itself is 160 feet high. Uh, a winter shutdown occurred during construction during the first 20 feet uh, after the first 20 feet of RCC had been placed. The following spring, the cold joint was, joint was cleaned, a mortar layer was placed, and the rest of the dam was constructed. A gallery was constructed in the dam with a drainage curtain placed through the potential cold joint. As a means of testing the water tightness of the joint, five six inch cores were taken through that cold joint. Three of the five were bonded at the joint and tested in direct shear. Originally, the assumed PMF or prob probable maximum flood could be passed without encroaching on a three and a half foot high parapet wall constructed in the, on the crest of the dam. I'm going to show you a picture of this in a second. Uh, the PMF, however, was recently revised and now puts 2.3 feet of water on the parapet wall. So this slide shows the dam geometry and the strength results. On the left, the figure shows what the RCC dam looks like in a section with the revised PMF water load on the left side of the structure. Uh, the fine dotted line shows the initial piezometric uplift distribution that's acting along the cold joint. So we're talking about right through there. Um, uh, and uh, the cold joint itself is along through here. So this, these are the measures of pressure along this line. Uh, note the break in the slope of the uplift distribution where it contacts uh, the line of drains coming out of the gallery. The figure on the right shows the results of the direct shear testing done on the cores in the area of the cold joint. These results will be used to inform our selection of the probability distributions of the strength parameters along the cold joint that we're going to use in our Monte Carlo analysis. So here we see uh, what those probability distributions are. Looking at the initial drain factor, we see a minimum of 0.33 and a maximum of 0.75 but we don't really know what the best estimate is, or um, as it's called in the table above, what the peak of the distribution should be. So if we're looking at a distribution like this, we don't know what the peak is, but we know what is a reasonable high and a reasonable low. Therefore, a, a uniform distribution was selected because we don't really have a good understanding of what the value is likely to be, just that it's somewhere between 0.33 and 0.75. So rather than having a more triangular or bell-shaped curve, this distribution would essentially look like a flat horizontal line between uh, our two values because all values should be sampled equally across the range during the Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo analysis, as opposed to like a bell curve where 
At the edges, we're not going to be sampling very often, but where it peaks up, we're going to be sampling those quite a bit. Um, same for the RCC unit strength, uh, excuse me, unit weight. For phi, cohesion, and percent intact, a triangular distribution defining, defined by the minimum, peak, and maximum were selected to represent the data. So this slide shows what the uh, stability analysis inputs look like when they are put into a spreadsheet. Not much to see here. Um, and there are the results of the Monte Carlo analysis. Using 10,000 iterations, the analysis yielded an average factor of safety of 2.42 and a minimum factor of safety of 1.43. The table shows which input parameters influence the results of the, uh, the results the most. For instance, changes in the values of the, co of the intact cohesion yielded significant changes in the calculated factor of safety, but changes in concrete density didn't really cause much change in the results. Note that the analysis did not yield any results that fell below a factor of safety of 1.0. Does this mean that the probability of failure is zero? Eh, not necessarily. Remember, all model models are wrong, some are useful. Just because the analysis doesn't yield any results that fall below a factor of safety of one doesn't necessarily mean that we should rule out the possibility of failure. Some options for when this occurs arranged in order of decreasing preference include using the information qualitatively. Uh, we touched on this one earlier. The results could be used as just one factor among many when considering the likelihood of failure. We could also widen the ranges of the uh, input distributions if the available data indicates that's reasonable. That is, we could make uh, the lowest reasonable values of our inputs even lower, which would increase our uncertainty and probably open up more opportunity for the results to fall below a factor of safety of one. You could also increase the number of iteration simulation trials. If you ran 100 iterations in your Monte Carlo analysis, you might consider rerunning them with 1,000 or 10,000. This will not necessarily change the answer, but it will further fill in the distribution of the results, um, smoothing out the curve and potentially providing more detailed probability estimates particularly at like the tails of this thing where we're going to have some bad behavior maybe occurring. Um, or lastly, you could use a fitted analytical probability distribution to calculate the probability of a factor of safety falling below one. So essentially smacking a probability distribution on top of your results. In this case, you'd fit a pre-existing probability distribution over whatever results you currently have to help better define the extreme tails of the curve where there may be some likelihood of the factor of safety falling below one. In this way, you're extrapolating your results to get an estimate of failure. Here's what that last option might look like. Your actual Monte Carlo analysis was only 100 iterations and it built the blue bars on the graph. You could fit a probability distribution shown as the red line here in order to estimate what could be happening at the extreme minimum and maximum of the results. So we don't really have good clarity about what's happening here with our analysis, but we fit this red curve and we see maybe a little bit more detail about the action that's happening out here on the tail. But let's quickly talk about some of the caveats to that approach. The probability calculated in this manner would be, would by definition be obtained from the left tail of the analy analytical distribution since there are no actual iterations of the analysis that fall below a factor of safety of one. You'd be extrapolating the existing data to provide an estimate of failure. So we're not relying on actual results. Results were just an extrapolation of those results. The shape of the tail would depend closely on which analytical distribution was selected and how it was fitted to the Monte Carlo simulation data. There's a lot of thoughts and research that can go into just making that proper selection. The probability of the factor of safety, the probability that the factor of safety is below one could differ by orders of magnitude, depending on how the analytical distribution was fitted. Risk estimates for potential failure modes are plotted on logarithmic scales. Therefore, the difference between 0.1 and 0.2 is very little, but the difference between 0.1 and 0.01 can be very significant. You must be careful about how you fit those distributions because the implications of plotting the risk at different orders of magnitude can mean the difference between deciding to design and implement a multi-million dollar fix for a problem or doing nothing if that risk happens to plot on or near the tolerable risk, uh, uh, tolerable risk guidelines. Said more simply, the calculated probability of failure could change dramatically as a result of relatively minor changes to the stability analysis inputs. So in summary, this option should be used sparingly and the results interpreted, interpreted with caution. Using results as a direct analog for the event probability is not recommended when the results are obtained from a fitted curve. There's better ways of doing this. Sometimes it takes um, a better understanding of the parameters, some more thought, but um, this could be a, a quick way to uh, get a good idea of what the results could be. 
All right, uh, here's one more example, a foundation rock wedge stability failure mode. Um, so the foundation of an arch dam that was constructed in the 1920s has been found to contain a large and geometrically significant rock wedge. The risk associated with the foundation rock wedge instability are being considered as part of a comprehensive risk analysis. Um, so the potential failure mode involving the rock wedge includes the following events. The reservoir surface exceeds some critical elevation as it comes up behind the dam. Uh, the base item release planes of a rock wedge exist in situ and are continuous. So essentially we have this rock wedge that's existing in our abutment that our dam is bearing upon. And as the water comes up, it's being wanted, it's wanting to be forced out. So critical wedge movement initiates. And then uh, uh, number four, movement is significant enough to cause the concrete of the dam to crack. Arch forces can't be redistributed and a breach occurs. Um, so the team's having difficulty estimating that probability of event three, a uh, critical wedge movement initiates. What can we do to help inform their judgment on this node of the event tree? So, well, we can, you guessed it, run a probability equilibrium analysis, probabilistic limit state equilibrium analysis. So we decide to perform one of those dudes to uh, model the stability of the rock wedge. In order to carry out this analysis, we first need to estimate the inputs to the factor of safety equation. <clears throat> so the resultant force on the rock wedge is calculated using the results of a finite element analysis and a fracture flow focused seepage analysis and, and three wedge plane lift scenarios are developed. So we do some fancy things to come up with some inputs. That is universal across any problem we want to use this approach to. Um, so essentially we're using our more traditional engineering tools to come up with inputs to our probabilistic stability analysis. To run that analysis, a 3D wedge stability solution is programmed into, the, into Excel. Um, so it's a, essentially, it's a factor of safety analysis. We can use the results of a ge, uh, geologic field exploration and laboratory testing to develop the following strength parameters that can be resolved into distributions that we can put into our model. So we're figuring out, figuring out our driving forces with our robust tools. We're figuring out our resisting forces using the results of our field exploration and lab, laboratory testing. Um, and we generate some parameters that look a lot like these. Um, so for each of the uplift, uplift scenarios being considered, we'll again use a uniform distribution to model the resultant force magnitude acting on a rock wedge that spans plus or minus 20% on either side of our best estimate. So we put all these things into our analysis. Figure on the right of this slide shows the analysis set up in a spreadsheet. The results for the worst case uplift scenario indicate 55. So when I say worst, best, and, and uh, worst, uh, like most likely, and best case, that's sort of um, these are the range of the input parameters we're putting in. So results for the worst case uplift scenario indicate 55 of the 100,000 iterations of the Monte Carlo analysis resulted in factors safety lower than one. For best estimate uh, scenario, two of those 100,000 iterations resulted in safety factors lower than one. And for best case scenario, none of those iterations resulted in a factor safety of lower than one. So interpreted directly, these results would suggest uh, wedge movement initiation probabilities that are very low on the order of six times 10 to the minus four, two times 10 to the minus five, and essentially zero. So how do we use the results of our analysis? If they are directly interpreted as probabilities, those non-zero results, will be outside the range over which most estimators are well calibrated. As I think you've already, discuss already discussed in previous presentation uh, during this best practices thing, elicitors typically use verbal descriptors to help when making estimates for individual nodes on an, of an event tree, such as things like unlikely being equivalent to a nodal estimate of 0.1, very unlikely being equivalent to 0.01, and virtually impossible being equivalent to 0 0.001. Um, so that 0 0.001 or virtually impossible is typically considered to be the limit that humans can reasonably estimate probabilities. For instance, we uh, can anybody really uh, differentiate between one times 10 minus five and one times 10 to the minus six? When we're trying to estimate the likelihood of a single event occurring. Um, it's therefore preferable to interpret the probabilities yielded by the analysis as simulated frequencies or base rates that we adjust uh, based on other considerations, such as a list of more or less like factors um, that the risk team has come up with to, to uh, together to that apply to this event in, in the uh, in this failure scenario. All right, 
So that's about all I have for you. Um, but before we finish up, let's run back through some of these takeaways from this presentation. Probabilistic analysis results are infrequently used as a source of information for estimating the conditional probabilities of PF uh, of potential failure mode events. Said differently, they are a good, reasonable, fact-based way to inform your judgment about the performance of a structure or the likelihood of an event occurring. When the uncertainty of the analysis results is quantified, it can provide an additional layer of information to the risk estimators as well as for decision makers who will use the results of your assessment to inform real world damage level safety decisions. Probabilistic limit equilibrium analysis is one method of quantifying the effects of uncertainty in the, uh, in the input parameters. First order second moment analysis and simple sensitivity analysis are other ways of doing it, but probabilistic analysis uses a Monte Carlo simulation that is the best way to, to account for the uncertainty in your input parameters. It's, it's robust. You can uh, do different things with the results. Uh, it's pretty informative. Caution, however, must be used in interpreting the results of a probabilistic limit equilibrium analysis. In general, the results should be used to inform probability estimates, not define them. Again, every model is wrong, but some are useful. Use your model to inform your judgment, not be your judgment. The fact that most Monte Carlo software allows analytical distributions to be fitted to the data does not necessarily mean that that's always a good idea. Be wary of extrapolating those results.